So delighted to welcome Stephen Proctor, the author of The Long Golden Afternoon, um, The Golf's Age of Glory, 1864 to 1914, which is a wonderful history um, of the early years of English golf. Um, Stephen, I really wanted to open up by asking you about what the state of the game was in 1850 in Great Britain, um, three years ahead of golf first being played on the boroughs at Northam. You know, I think the game was in a little bit of a chancy spot in 1850 in Scotland. First off, it's wise to keep in mind that at that time, the game hadn't even spread through all of Scotland. There was a lot of golf in Scotland, but there were still places in Scotland where golf wasn't played even then. You know, there had been such social change and disruption from the Industrial Revolution by that time that it had started to put a damper on golf and, and, and golf started to, you know, flicker like a, like a light in some places, not going as well as it used to do. But what really happened was uh, right about 1850 and 1848, in fact, the gutty ball came along. And that was something that really gave golf another shot in the arm. And uh, so th just about 1850, that period of decline is coming to an end with the introduction of the gutty ball and through the 1850s up to 1860. And really the pivotal event is the institution of the Open Championship in 1860 that really gets the, you know, this golf going on a great wave that will carry it eventually south into England and, and then around the How world. How many golfers do you think there were in Scotland at that time, in, in say, 1850? And, and how, many, how many in England as well? Well, in 1850 in England, it would have numbered in the tens if, it ha if there were that many. Uh, you know, in 1850 in Scotland, probably in the low tens of thousands. You know, Scotland was not and still is not a very large country in terms of population. I think its population is around 5 million now. Uh, it would have been considerably smaller then. And so I would say there were, may, I don't know, I've never actually done a study of this in terms of population part of it. But I would say in the thirty to fifty thousand range, probably right. maximum. And the the Scottish connection was was key in terms of the first golf being played on northern boroughs in in North Devon. Um, Reverend Isaac Gossett, his brother in law, was General George Moncrief, and uh, from St Andrews. And I think Reverend Gossett, who was the the founder of of Raw North Devon, first came into contact with golf in probably the 1830s or 1840s, visiting his sister, who was married to, to General Moncrief. Um, but actually, it was his brother, I think, uh, William Driscoll Gossett, who was an officer in the Royal Engineers based at Ayr, who, who, who was the person who probably pointed out the suitability of golf at Northern Boroughs. You know, it's fascinating because everywhere where you see golf get transplanted, there is almost, without exception a Scottish connection. And it's Englishmen who know Scots that introduce the game to England. And uh, it's it's true at North Devon, it's true at Hoylake, and it's true to a lesser extent at Wimbledon. But let's just start with the North Devon story. Uh, William Gossett gets stationed at Ayr to make ordnance maps. And in the process of living there, he comes to know Old Tom. Old Tom introduces him to golf in the same way that General Moncrief and uh, had introduced Isaac to golf. And then he goes to visit, uh, I believe they were cousins is what I understand. But in any case, it's the, the relationship is immaterial. He, he, and, he and Isaac are visiting at North Devon, uh, and um, they go take a walk on the burrows. And they both decide right then and there that, you know, this is perfect land for golf, the kind of land they play golf on in Scotland. And there isn't any reason that we shouldn't be playing golf ourselves here and so they do what they would you know they do what what anyone would do they ordered clubs from old tom they ordered clubs and balls and they got a set of them sent down and then they started playing out on the burrows and naturally you know in a small town like uh, like north devon the neighbors are going to take much greater note of what what people are up to and uh, and so some of their english uh friends uh, started to join in and play with them, and it, it, it started to become increasingly popular. And um, so in 1860, they had Tom, you know, Tom came to help them put together a better course. 
So he laid out a kind of a rudimentary course. And then, um, you know, so many people started playing that they got the idea that they would form a club. And in 1864, they did form the North Devon and West of England Golf Club, which was as it was originally known. Um, and uh, in 1864, Tom came back. And this time he laid out a much more formal links for them, which was the first seaside links ever created outside Scotland. And uh, they they had a you know a meeting and they formed a club and they had 51 members if my memory is correct, and of those three quarters of them were native born Englishmen completely new to the game of golf, and this was the thing, the point that made North Devon revolutionary and gave it the reputation that it richly deserves as the cradle of English golf because it was the first place in Scotland I mean excuse me in England where Englishmen played golf. Golf had been played in England for a very long time at Blackheath since James I came in the 1600s with his uh, with his cabinet and things uh, and the people who his entourage, they played. There was golf played at Kersal Moor also in Manchester, but that was played exclusively by Scots. There were no Englishmen playing except maybe a stray royal, but there were no uh, what you would call middle class English people playing golf until Westward Ho came along in 1864, and that was a hugely revolutionary development. Yeah, in what the game. was the what was the sort of makeup of this this nascent golf community at at Westwood Ho? I mean, what what type of people were they? What class of people were they from? Only wealthy people played golf at the beginning in Britain, in in England, and that was true in Scotland as well. And it would become true in America when the game spread to America, for a couple of different reasons. One is that only wealthy people would have the connections with merchant Scots that would, learn, would get them to know that golf existed as a game and that it was something they could try and play. So they, no one else would have such a relationship. Secondarily, golf was, was then and remains to some extent an expensive pastime. It was a particularly expensive pastime then uh, and because, you know, you had club dues and all these other things, and only only well-to-do people could afford that. And really, only well-to-do people had sufficient leisure time to pursue the game. So uh, the audience in Britain would have been only wealthy people, well, I would say, well, until the middle of the 1890s, uh, when the broader population uh, began to take the game up in really, really great numbers maybe starting just a bit before 1880, you know, about, about 1888, 89. And then by the time it got to be, by the middle of the 1890s, it was a fairly a big movement then, a substantial growth uh, and of both men and women in England playing golf. And that would be still be middle class to upper middle class people, not necessarily that many working class people, but, but still a, a lot of people playing golf. And by I certainly then. think it's safe to say that those early pioneers playing golf at Westwood Ho were viewed with some suspicion by the graziers or the pot wallopers who, um, who had their <laughs> animals on the burrows at, at, uh, at Northern, because at that time there were 2,200 sheep, 200 bullocks, 150 horses, 20 donkeys and 50 geese roaming the, uh, roaming the burrows. You know, they uh, probably were considered crazy by the locals at the beginning. I, I, in his, in his memoir, Horace Hutchinson, who grew up at, at North Devon, uh, remarked that even as late as the 1880s, if you carried golf clubs on a train, you got strange looks from people like, what are you doing with those bizarre implements? And uh, so it was it was a very unknown thing when it first came into England. And certainly, you know, the people who played at Westward Ho were the very first Englishmen to play golf in any serious did we, numbers. Did we talk about that period from from 1864 to, to 1871? And the reason I, I choose 1871 is that's the birth of of John Henry Taylor, but that, that first seven years of the club, so much happened, you know, there was, you know, not only at, 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 Royal, at well, at the um, North Devon and West of England golf club, but also um, within English golf, because you had the formation of London Scottish, the, the golf club on Wimbledon common. You had the formation of, of Liverpool golf club, later Royal Liverpool. You had, you know, Tommy Morris's hat trick of open belts, can you talk a little bit about that um, that period, if you like, in the game? You know, at the, the very beginning of your book, you know, which covers the year eighteen sixty four to nineteen fourteen, that first flare of popularity for golf in England. 
you know, yes. And I think the big turning point, uh, it, it, as it turns out, is the uh, founding of Hoy Lake. Uh, Hoy Lake being so close to Liverpool was home to a lot of Scotch, Muir, Scottish merchants, one of whom was James Muir Dowie, who was related to by marriage to Robert Chambers, uh, one of the great golfers from Edinburgh, who was a winner of an early amateur championship. Uh, early version of an amateur championship. And he also was the publisher of Chambers Edinburgh Journal, which covered golf extensively. And um, so when they formed Hoy Lake in 1869, they were a group of really progressive forward linking people who were well suited to make a big impact in the game because of their location next to Liverpool, which was a huge uh, gateway to the world for England at that time. And, you know, it's a little bit less so in North Devon, which is very remote uh, to be able to, it's a little harder to assume a leadership role in the game from that distance. Whereas at Hoylake, they were well suited to it. And, you know, Horace, again, quoting Horace, he, he, he said that uh, if it hadn't been for the forward thinking nature of the members of the Royal Liverpool Golf Club, of which he was also one, he was the member of every important golf club, not just Westward Ho. Uh, that, you know, the, England might not have come into its golfing heritage because they would go and do a lot of really important things, establishing the amateur championship, establishing the international matches, uh, really turning to the Royal and Ancient to kind of ask them to take a leadership role in things, which is, which is of course, I think what the majority of golfers at that time wanted or how it turned out in the long run. But, you know, the, the leaders of Hoy Lake were well ahead of everything. Uh, the other thing is, you know, Hoylake had a very strong connection with the Morris family itself, you know, because Jack Morris, who is the Tom's nephew, the brother of his, the son of his brother George, be, is the first professional at Hoylake and stays there sixty years, every day of his, all the way up the, to the end of his life, and so, as a consequence of that, uh, there was great ties between St Andrews and Hoy Lake, and they came to be important in the way I'll describe here in 30 seconds. But by by far, the biggest influence on the development of golf in England was the Open Championship. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is that London gamblers thought the Open Championship was a really excellent betting proposition, and they liked betting on it. And that naturally resulted in more coverage in the newspapers. And when you get more coverage in the newspapers, you get more attention paid by average people and more people are asking the question, what is this golf? And maybe moving toward taking up golf or, you know, forming a club in their own community. So it all becomes part of a snowball effect. But the big event, the huge event was Tommy winning the belt three times in a row as a teenage sensation when he was 17, 18 and 19. And as far as North Devon is concerned, Tommy had a, a, a close connection with North Devon because after they formed the club in 1864, they f hired his childhood best friend, Johnny Allen, uh, who he played with growing up on the links at Presswick. Johnny Allen was the son of a stonemason in Presswick, and uh, he and Tommy were very tight their whole lives. And he, when he was preparing to win the belt by winning it for the third year in a row, he started with the training tour of England. And he came and he played in uh, a couple, a big series of singles matches with Johnny Allen and Bob Kirk. Bob Kirk was uh, one of Tom's workmen, another close friend of Tommy's and a great golfer in his own right, as was Johnny Allen. And they had a series of singles matches that brought a huge amount of attention to North Devon and to England and were reported widely in the newspapers all across Scotland. And then he went on to Hoy Lake and played at Hoy Lake. Uh, and so he was just, you know, tuning himself up for the big event in 1870. So in the spring of 1870, prior to playing and winning the belt with his uh, extraordinary score of 149, he had made a training tour of England. And that you can imagine the tension that brings at that time. Here's the superstar, won it twice. Everybody figures he's even money to win it a third time and claim the belt. And here he is at all these prominent clubs of England playing golf. And that is something that was, I feel, really helped to light the fire of the eventual English golf. Yeah, and I think that it's really interesting that that triangle, if you like, between, um, well, it's not really a triangle, but that those connections that are being formed 
between St Andrews, Hoylake, uh, Royal North Devon. You know, in terms of that that sort of um, transfer of of knowledge, of experience, of competition, etc. Because you know, obviously there was the money match with with Tommy Morris, Bob Kirk, and and Johnny Allen at, at, at Westwood Ho, but also um, one of the great sort of early characters in the history of of the club at Royal North Devon was Captain Arthur Molesworth who um, was, you know, the old mole, as he was known, um, was a big money match player. And he actually, I believe, played in Tommy Morris's last ever match in the snow at St. Andrews. His his son did. Oh, his son. It was his son, was it? Like, but I, I thought it was yes, a father so and son's match, he, was it not? Went, with, with, with old Tom and... No, ah. no, it was just Tommy versus Arthur Jr. It was a very complicated match. You know, Arthur, the old mole, the big guy, he came, he was... Uh, Wow, he was a wild character. You know, he had a carriage that he would come barreling across the burrows in this carriage to the old iron hut that was the clubhouse there. And he was a wild gambler. And what happened was he came to St. Andrews. His son was quite a player. Uh, and his son, uh, I'm sure, has got to have his name on the honor board at Royal North Devon a million times. He was quite one of the better amateur golfers of the age. And his father came up and basically challenged uh, young Tommy's backers. You know, the players never set the matches themselves. Money people that were prepared to back them with big dollars set the matches up. So the old mole comes to town and he's, you know, my son will take on Tommy, but he's got to have uh, a third, you know, in other words, uh, six strokes for every 18 holes. So there's a huge, huge, huge sums of money are bet on this match. Um, and there were bets for, who won, what the total number of strokes per player, uh, who won each round. So there was multiple, multiple ways of betting on this match. And as I understand it, I think, you know, well into the hundreds of pounds of money was bet on the match. And of course, the weather was horrible. Uh, Major Hopkins that you were mentioning to me before we got recording has a famous painting of the match where they swept a little circle around the flag of snow. It snowed uh, like substantially during a portion of the match, and they just painted the balls red and played on. They were golfers back then. They didn't, you know, do lift clean in place because it might rain or anything silly like that. They played golf. And, uh, you know, Tommy ended up winning the match and all the money for his backers and so forth and so on. But it was that was the last match Tommy played in. It was against Arthur Jr., uh, and, uh, and, you know, it was a last big money match. He played in some friendlies and stuff, but so, yeah, no, the, the Arthur Moles were senior. The old bowl was one of the great early characters of golf and, uh, was certainly a prominent figure on the scene wherever he went, whether it was St. Andrews or his home in North yeah, Devon. Somebody who, who got his nickname because he found it quite difficult to get the ball in the air, but, uh, but had a wonderful putting stroke apparently. And I, as I understand it, he only played with three clubs, which was, a uh, a driver, an iron, and a putter, which were known respectively as faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and charity, yes. You know, it was way more common to play with fewer clubs then. I think Tommy carried seven. Most people carried fewer than eight or nine at the most. So it wasn't until a much later time that people carried that many clubs. And uh, then and now, great putting will make up for a lot of misdeeds. Absolutely. And actually, looking at talking of Major Hopkins, Major Francis Hopkins, who was sort of better known as as Short Spoon was one of the first people to, to really write about golf um, regularly in the Field magazine in the 1870s. But it's more famous for his watercolours and oil paintings, which depict scenes from, you know, the early days of the games, you know, particularly in England at Westwood Ho, which is where he retired and really where he took up playing the game. But he also painted a lot of scenes at, at Hoylake and at Blackheath and at St Andrews as well. And, and he has, as you mentioned a wonderful painting of of the mole the old mole barreling down the uh the road to the iron hut at uh you know near the pebble ridge at westward ho with his sons in the background and I, as i understand it i think i think it might have been molesworth jr was meant to be playing against um tommy and john ball the next year were they not at, at hoylake there was meant to be a game was there not where, where yes where john ball was meant to be playing with his hero. Yes, that it was going to be uh, Tommy and John Ball Jr. against Davy Strath and Arthur Molesworth, if I remember correctly. Uh, and uh, 
you know, as it turned out, Tommy passed away before that match could take place. Uh, that was in 1875. And uh, some years later, as, you, as you've read in The Long Golden Afternoon, uh, the match was played, but Davy Strath partnered John Ball, uh, and I forget who else was in it now. I don't have the book in front of me. But, um, no, that was, you know, obviously Tommy's death is the greatest tragedy in the history of golf, and one wonders how many more opens he might have won. He was only 24. He had at least 10 good years of golf in him still. So, And there was nobody close to him at the time of his death except for Davy Strath. Nobody who could really give him regularly give him a good game. So it's uh, something that I think about a lot, actually, how much he might have done had he not passed away. How, so how much of the, the early years of the game in England were informed by these money matches that, that happened, you know, at great centres like or the early the early sort of bastions of the game like Westwood Ho? Royal Liverpool, et cetera. Is that how the sort of popularity of the game was was transmitted and, and grew? That certainly did a lot to make the game more popular in the sense that the matches were much hyped in the paper and things like that. But, you know, honestly, the English, almost from the outset, tended to prefer stroke play to match play. Uh, and, you know, there's um, the first really big tournament that happens in England is when Tommy wins the belt and there's discord at Presswick about what to do next and a year passes without an open, here again you have the forward thinking of members of Hoylake stepping into the breach. They stage a tournament in April of 1872 called the Grand Tournament for Professionals. They put up a hundred pounds sterling for the pot, which was a staggering sum at that time. They paid 15 pounds to the winner, uh, which was more than twice what the open paid. And it was the largest purse that had ever been given out in a professional event at that moment. And, you know, they wanted the big names to come to England and show off in England. And they also paid all the railway expenses of any professional who decided to come. They picked up his tab, which was absolutely unheard of. I mean, the revolutionary nature of that is somewhat difficult for a modern person, I think, to wrap their mind around in such a class conscious society where, you know, the, the professionals who had their railroad pass played still couldn't come in the clubhouse, you know, but they came and they all came. Every one of them came and Tommy played and he and Davey ran neck and neck for the first 18. Davey had the lead and Tommy hunted him down in the second 18, which is a script you always want. And uh, so that, you know, that really got English golf on the map. And uh, but even, you know, uh, as you go along, Horace Hutchinson, of course, he wrote Badminton Golf, but he also wrote something a year, two years later called the Oval Series of Games. He wrote a book there about golf, and he has an essay in there in which he talks about how the golf was adopted in England, and he mentions that the English preference for stroke play and that they kept score in matches, which made the people they were playing, the Scots they played matches against, absolutely berserk because they would putt out on every hole. Even if they were conceded to putt, they would putt it out because they wanted their score. And so there was much more of an interest in score play in England from the very earliest days than there, than there ever was in Scotland. And I think that, you know, that turned out to be something of a turning point in golf because, you know, the game changes a lot when score play is the heart of the game as opposed to yeah. match I mean, play. We, we mentioned Horace Hutchinson there. I mean, obviously a, a huge figure in the history of, of Royal North Devon, but also in the early history of English golf. Um, and an extraordinary coming together, if you like, of, of two figures that were pivotal in the early years of the game in England. You know, Horace, as a teenager, uh, coming home from Oxford to play at Westwood Ho, and the little houseboy, John Henry Taylor, uh, who works at his, his childhood home, caddying for him. I mean, these, what, you know, what can you tell us about these two, two characters from their early days and the importance that they had you know, in the in the early years of English golf? I would say to you, Dan, that those are the two most important figures in pre-war golf, in my opinion. Horace, because of the fact that he was the first great writer about golf and the writer and editor. And he gave, um, his works were so influential. They were, you know, Darwin, Bernard Darwin, who would become the most famous and greatest of all golf writers, grew up idolizing Horace Hutchinson's work 
and read his the famous badminton golf book, which the introduction of that book itself in 1890 was a really pivotal thing for the success of golf. The fact that it was recognized with its own volume of the badminton library of sports and pastimes. But Horace wasn't simply great as a writer. He was also influential in every big club. He was a member at Hoylake. He was a member at the Royal and Ancient. Horace Hutchinson was on the rules committee when they had to make the decision about whether the Haskell ball should be barred. He voted for allowing the Haskell to continue, by the way, and, and carried the day with the majority. But he was at the epicenter of the game at every moment of its existence from his days at Westward Ho until his very tragic death. Uh, he was also a great golfer himself. He won the amateur twice, two of the first three times it was played. It was first played in 1885 and won by a Scotsman named Alan McPhee, who was actually lived in, in Liverpool and was a member there, but was an, a Scot by, by birth. And then Horace won the next two, uh, in the second one beating John Ball on his home course. Horace was quite a, a, a formidable golfer, played in the open numerous times as well. Uh, I think he played eight times in the open. And his best finish was sixth in 1890, uh, but he had a number of top tens. And uh, the big tragedy of his life, as far as the Open was concerned, is that in 1892, the Open was played at 72 holes for the first time at Muirfield. And after the first 36, Horace had a huge lead. Uh, he fell apart in the final two rounds, but he always was one of his great regrets that it hadn't been a 36-hole opener. He might have actually won. He was very wild. Uh, he, he himself described his own swing as being one of bombastic freedom. And, uh, you know, basically when he was swinging, all parts were moving furiously. And he, was, he really lashed at the ball. And, in fact, you know, he developed a really close relationship with Tom Moore Sr., partly because of his membership at the RNA and his, his, um, his you know, frequent visits to St. Andrews. But he and Tom became quite close. And um, Tom, uh, I think, saw a little bit of his son in, in the way Horace just lashed at the ball. You know, Tommy, you know, went after every swing with everything he had. And, and Horace was that way, too. Horace was similar to Tommy also in the sense he had tremendous powers of recovery from the many difficult spots he got himself into off the tee. And he was quite a formidable player. You know, but at any great moment in history, you're likely to find Horace. One of the people that uh, Walter Travis beats in the last few matches of the 1904 amateur uh, was Horace. Uh, and, you know, when that was probably the most shocking thing to happen in Britain in the early part of the 1900s was Walter Travis coming from America. He was actually Australian, but he came from America to win the amateur. And, uh, you know, I think people expected Bobby Maxwell to, to thwart him eventually. But, you know, Horace came up with one of those days where he played brilliantly and he knocked out Maxwell but it knocked himself out trying to knock Maxwell out and then got knocked out by Walter Travis later that same afternoon. So he's, he's there at every moment. And then, you know, so he's very influential in all ways as a writer, as a thinker, as an administrator in the game. And he is the first Englishman who is in a Royal to be named the captain of the Royal and ancient golf club, which just goes to show you, uh, the, uh, the eminence in which he was held. He, there's a beautiful portrait of Horace that hangs in the big room of the Royal and Ancient even today. So he was one of the most important figures in the history of the game. You know, I actually don't think, though, that he was the most important figure in his own household. Uh, the most important figure in his household was the boot black, uh, John Henry Taylor, who's, who, uh, who started his life uh, black in the boots for Colonel William Nelson Hutchinson, Horace's father and Horace and the family. And he sometimes caddied for Horace at North Devon also. Uh, but eventually, um, North Devon had the first working man's club in golf. Uh, and John Henry Taylor, as he would be all his life, was one of the leaders of that club. And they, as all these working clubs do, I think still today, but you would know better than me, they played an annual match against the members of North Devon themselves. And Taylor was matched against Hutchinson, his his one time boss, and uh, and he uh, he played brilliantly against him. He had to play against. He was uh, putting tar on some of the uh, sleepers that hold up bunkers in the morning, and it got his only pair of pants splattered with tar. So he had to play 
against Horace <clears throat> to his great shame in a pair of work overalls that were completely splattered with tar. And uh, he ended up beating Hutchinson and they had a rematch some years later over at Burnham and Barrow when John became a pro over there and uh, beat him again. So John Henry Taylor, the reason I think he's so important to golf is that a couple different things. He was the leader of his generation among the great triumvirate of Varden, Braid, Taylor. Taylor was the undis uh, undisputed leader of those men. Uh, and Andrew Kirkati has a wonderful quote in my book about about how all golfers in the world look up to John Henry Taylor. He is the person who led the formation of the, the Professional Golfers Association in the early 1900s. <coughs> Excuse me. What happened was around 1900, clubs started deciding that, you know what? We're not going to let the pro have the pro shop anymore. We're going to make the pro shop an independent business that goes to the highest bidder. If the pro can bid the highest, then it can be theirs. And that just cut off one third of the salary of every pro if you did that. And the pros got all up in arms. And a, a pro named Peter Paxton wrote a letter to the editor say, well, if pros are in earnest, let John Henry Taylor stand up. People called right on him at the beginning. And he did stand up. And he got the PGA formed. And he, he was quite close friends with George Riddle, the newspaper proprietor. And uh, George Riddle uh, ran the News of the World. And the News of the World put 200 pounds up to create a series of tournaments that were qualifying tournaments that led to the News of the World. And so not only did they thwart the takeover of the pro shop, but they also created a tour for the middling professional. You know, John Henry Taylor and Varden and Braid, they made good money because they got to play in the big championships. But the middling pros could barely survive, and this new tour gave them a lot of opportunities to go play and earn money competitively and keep their head above water. So Taylor's the man who's responsible for that. When he retired, he was um, he focused on getting the first public golf course ever built in London. It drove Taylor crazy that all Scottish courses practically were public and no English courses were public. He didn't like that. He was dead set on changing that. And he and Riddle, he, Riddle helped him again to get Richmond Park built in London, which Taylor himself designed. And it was so successful that a second 18 was built the following year. Taylor also was instrumental in, like I said, he was instrumental in forming the, work, the North and Working Man's Club, but he was also instrumental in forming the Artisan Golfers Association to sort of empower all artisan golfers all over England. And in his retirement years, he served on the council until his late age. So he was always working on behalf of golfers and in particular on behalf of public golf. And that's why I feel like Taylor is golf's indispensable man is the way I referred to him in the long golden afternoon. So it's just such a such a feather in the cap of North Devon that they produced these two heroically important figures in the game of golf, and they should be so proud. Yeah, of I mean, them. I think this is beautifully put, but the you know the, the the connections with the birth of the artisans, the 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 birth of the PGA, but also you know going back further still in 1868. Um, Westwood Ho Ladies Club was formed, you know, the first of its kind in in England, you know, and you know the the, the and the only the second in yeah. the world. What? Um, yeah, no, that was a big deal. That was a big deal, and there's a lot of interesting things to say about that. First off, once again, it's the St Andrews connection because in 1867, Old Tom laid out the uh, what is now known in in Scotland as the Himalayas, but at that time was known as the Ladies links and um, the lady st andrews golf club was formed in 1867 and it's the oldest women's golf club in the world the second oldest is the one formed the following year at north devon it didn't last forever i think it faded out around 1879 or 80 and then was resuscitated a decade later but uh so once again north devon is in the lead of women's golf being taken up in england and it's uh my my fellow historian and friend michael morrison has a wonderful book called The Great English Golf Boom, in which he has done a lot to document the growth of individual clubs and the rate at which clubs grew. And one of the more shocking findings in that book is that is in the later part of the 1890s in England, growth among women golfers exceeds growth among men golfers. That's how strongly women took up the game. 
And, uh, you know, it's that original nexus, North Devon, Hoy Lake, Wimbledon, and in particular Wimbledon, where the ladies uh, really become strong. You know, Isette Pearson is a member of the Royal Wimbledon Club in 1893. She and William Laidlaw Purvis, uh, who was himself a Scotsman from Edinburgh, uh, formed the Ladies Golf Union. And, uh, and then, you know, Ladies Golf really starts to grow and make a world of its own that's quite a great story, which is the story I'm currently working on. So uh, North Devon, again, right there at the epicenter of things at the very yeah, beginning. Well, it's, 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 it's uh, had, an, had an amazing sort of role in the early history of the game. Just going back to John, John Henry Taylor uh, for a minute, just in terms of his personality. I mean, you know, his achievements are incredible. You know, it, there's an amazing plaque as you come into the clubhouse at Raw North Devon, which says John Henry Taylor, Northern caddy boy and five-time Open champion. Um, which is, you know, and his locker is still in the in the locker room there, and his his portrait is obviously in the clubhouse, and some of his clubs are there, and you know he is somebody who is absolutely um, at the core of the club, if you like. His his story and his 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 legacy, if you like, are, are proudly um, you know looked upon at the club. But just about him as a sort of personality, I mean, some of the things that I've found, some of the descriptions or adjectives used about J.H. Taylor, determined, square, short, compact, tense, highly strung, straight, religious, you know, in terms of his his personality, but also as a golfer. I mean, I understand that he played everything off, off the right foot and had a very sort of, you know, very sort of piercing trajectory to his, to his shots, but also the, in the way that he, he tackled the game and he approached the game and he approached his life. He was... Um, he was a sort of formidable, but 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 very sort of straight character, wasn't he? Yes, he was. You know, he was a natural born leader for starters. He was he just took leadership roles everywhere and people looked to him to lead them, as we were discussing earlier. So that's one thing. He was a reader. You know, he kept reading all his life, you know, like most working class children, his parents, his father was a laborer and his mother took in washing. Uh, and so he was at the very, very bottom rung of society when he was a young man. And um, but he he did exceptionally well in school. He he was obviously quite bright uh, and he continued to read all his life. I think his uh, his favorite writer was uh, Samuel Johnson, who uh, 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 who is, you know, the the dictionary writer. And he also enjoyed Dickens, but he read all of his life. Um, he was, um, as far as a golfing personality was concerned, he, 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 his, when he swang, it was as if his feet were nailed to the ground. He, somebody would ask him, how do you play? He'd say flat footed golf, sir, flat footed golf. And it was like his, his legs were like post attached to the ground. And he had a short clipped swing that was, you know, created a really low trajectory that would bite. And so, um, you know, when, Horace Hutchinson wrote a book called the golf book of golf and golfers, where he highlighted most of the great swings of the day. Uh, he did not highlight John Henry's swing. Cause, and he said, so why, even though he had won many opens was that his swing was very unorthodox and it wasn't one that could be copied just by any person. Uh, you know, John Henry was really strong man, physically quite strong. And you'd have to be a strong man to swing the club the way he did and get the distances he did uh, from his shots. Everything was like a three quarter swing. Um, he is, without any doubt, the greatest foul weather player golf has ever known, and that speaks a lot to his personality. I think Bernard Darwin wrote of him, my, how he tugged his hat down and stuck his chin out and lashed the ball into that gale. You know, he just, he he was a relentless person, uh, very kind and intelligent, though, and I think um, everyone loved John Henry Taylor, except maybe uh, Scotsman, you know, at the beginning, because... Uh, he was the first English professional to take them down. And uh, the first time he did at 1894 at Royal St. George's, you know, some of that was John Henry grew up in North Devon. His first assignment was Burnham and Barrow. He was not afraid to play in wind. He'd been playing in a gale all his life. So, you know, the gales that blew in off Pegwell Bay during that open didn't phase him at all. And, and not with the way he hit the ball, wind was never a problem for him. And uh, so he won that open comfortably, but I, definitely his proudest moment, and he says so in his memoir, is uh, the following year, 1895. Everyone is like, no way he can repeat that at St. Andrews. 
not with the fiery greens we have. He won't be able to stop his ball and so forth and so on. Now, it did rain kind of heavily during that tournament, but the bottom line is he went to St. Andrews and he knocked them all down again. And that was the single greatest moment in English professional golf up to that time. Uh, so to for an Englishman to win at the at St. Andrews, you know, against all the greats of St. Andrews was quite a thing. And John Henry was by far the most celebrated golfer in England, even the first few years after Varden started making a name for himself. Taylor was still considered the yeah, big I man. Yeah, I mean, just looking, uh, trying to judge how good those uh, those players were, you know, the great tram for Horace Hutchinson, you know, John Ball, Tommy Morris. I mean, if we're looking at, at, at John Henry Taylor, you know, as you said, he won his first Open in eighty in ninety four, rather repeated the feat in ninety five. I think it was was it nineteen thirteen at Hoy Lake. He played in some of the worst weather ever, and and that was when he yes. he literally pre- he framed those scorecards. Yeah, produced this in, this absolute. He framed those scorecards. He was so proud of those two rounds. You know, he shot seventy seven seventy five in an absolute gale. As he walked up to the first tee, uh, the wind swept away all the tents, all the press tents. All the accommodation tents, they were just blown away in a gale. He just put a tee in the ground and marched forward and shot 77. And uh, he framed the scorecard from that because he thought it was the greatest golf he'd ever played. And he was particularly proud to have won at all the major venues, St. George's, Hoylake, and St. Andrews. You know, Varden never won at St. Andrews or at Hoylake. And uh, Braid never won anywhere except on Scottish soil either. So Taylor was the one who won at every great venue, who had the traveling game. And I think maybe that's something that he doesn't quite get as much credit for as he should. I don't think he was quite the golfer of either Varden or Braid, honestly. Uh, they had more length on him, and I think they had more shots in their bag. But he just was a determined soul. And, a, you know, if you get – if I wouldn't want to be nose-to-nose with John Henry Taylor down the stretch. Let's put it that way, because you know – he is uh he's not quitting until the last one drops and um he i think at hoylake that year that he won at hoylake in 1913 he barely qualified i think he had to sink a 6 footer to qualify and it kind of wobbled around on the putt edge of the hole like a drunken man and finally toppled in and bernard darwin turns to a friend and said it'll be just like john to win it all now you know and and of course he did go out and win it all so you know, I think also, you know, one Sorry, of the- I think growing up at Raw North Devon, you know, playing in the gales and the and the sheeting rain and the winds that you that you get when you play at play at Westwood Ho, um, like you say, just just armed him and, and gave him that great ability to play in the wind. And like you say, it didn't phase him at all. No, he and I agree with you 100 percent, Dan, is that he had the right kind of upbringing. And, uh, you know, he um, he just was. Uh, a really interesting man. I think maybe his proudest moment in life was that his son, uh, the son of a boot black, got to play in the varsity match at Oxford at Burnham and Barrow, which was where John had his first job as a professional. His mother sent him off with all of his clothes in a box and a pound in his pocket, and that was everything he had. And off he went to Burnham and Barrow and made a great success of himself. What men those guys were, you know, to, to, uh, to hang with it all that time and to, to fight their way up. And I think the other thing that John Henry is the leader in this too, uh, but Varden and Taylor, Varden and Braid also deserve credit, which is they earn the respect of these gentlemen who Jace basically looked down their noses at them at the beginning. And in the end, you know, um, the, they were really, really respected figures. You know, Braid would be invited to dinner with the Prince of Wales his daughter would call him up the next morning and say, did you get to sit next to the prince? And Bray would say, no, he sat next to me. You know, so they, he helped to lift those men up and they all lifted up the profession in a way that they deserve tremendous credit for. Um, I think every golf professional who earns money today uh, uh, should give a nod of respect to John Henry for starting Just in terms of the equipment they were using, Stephen, you know, if you look at what Horace and... And John Henry were using, you know, in their early days, and and the scores that they put up, and the scores that you see in the record books on the on the honors boards at, at Royal North Devon, you know, the courses themselves. I mean, even let's even if we rewind a little from eighteen ninety four when John Henry Taylor wins his first Open, but if we're looking at 
you know, uh, Royal North Devon in the early days, in, the, in its first 25 years, green's pretty rough, you know, nothing like the condition that you have today. And even today, the golf course is one of the most natural tests you'll ever, you'll ever find. You know, you still have, you know, sheep grazing the course and, you know, it's not, it's not as defined as, as, you, as many other links are, but that's part of its great charm. But, you know, the courses in those days were, you know, you look at the, the early pictures of, of Major Hopkins, aka Short Spoon, and the greens were just slightly shorter bits of fairway. The tees were next to the greens. Um, you know, they were playing with long nosed clubs. Um, I mean, obviously not, not John Henry, but these guys were playing with equipment and producing scores that is, is hard to, hard to really fathom, isn't it? How good they probably were. These were great, great, great golfers. And, you know, I think a modern player might look at John 77 at Hoylake in that driving range and not think, well, that's not such a big deal, but I just, here's the example I will give you. And we got to go back to Tommy to do this. You know, in 1870, Preswick was a 12-hole course, and you played three rounds of 12. Tommy's opening round in the 1870 championship was 47, which is a staggering number for 12 holes. In the year of the 150th Open Championship, Preswick recreated the 12-hole course identical to the way that it had been when Tommy scored the 47. They invited uh, several hundred golfers from around the world to come and play with whatever equipment they chose to. Most people played their modern equipment and many people, a few people tried to take him on with hickory clubs, uh, which were of course the clubs that he played. Uh, and only one person was able to shoot a score lower than 47 all these years later. So to me, that's, the greatest evidence of all of the degree to which these men played great golf. You have to keep in mind, John Henry Taylor probably played with eight hickory clubs, uh, which did not have grooves on the faces. They would have had little dots. So you couldn't really stop the ball except by means of applying uh, some sort of spin as you hit it. And uh, so they had to be artists at stopping the ball. Uh, they had to be incredibly resilient, the agronomy was terrible compared to what it is now. Your, your lies were horrible most of the time. Um, the gutty ball was difficult to get airborne uh, without a perfect strike. And I play hickory clubs all the time now. That is my regular game when I'm playing in anything. I play with hickories. And a miss hit with the hickory is going to be a terrible shot, unlike a miss hit with a modern club, which will be a modestly decent shot. So I think one of the biggest things that I've tried to do with my books is to get people to understand how great this golf was and that you can't look at it simply as a number. Uh, you know, that the, 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 the way these men were able to play and women uh, staggers the imagination. It really does. And uh, John Henry Taylor, uh, I think when he first became noticed by Harold Hilton, he shot a 73 at Presswick. Uh, in about 1893, I think it was, or 92. But anyway, uh, 73 at Presswick and the kind of wind you get there and the terrible conditions of the of the fairways and things at that time, it's, just, it's, it's mind-boggling. So they were great, great players. Yeah, absolutely. And um, obviously com coming up to the end of the period which your book covers, you know, which is, the, the, it finishes in 1914. But in 1912, Horace... Um, probably due to his connections with the RNA and his standing at the RNA managed to persuade or managed to persuade the organizers of the amateur championship to bring the amateur championship to, to Royal North Devon in 1912. And, and his sort of great friend, Johnny Ball won his eighth and final amateur championship at Royal North Devon. Um, what can you tell us about, I mean, John Ball is it over yeah, eight and, who was also an artisan golfer. So there's a sort of perfect circularity yes. around um, around that. But John Ball is obviously a huge figure, the central figure in the long golden afternoon. But what can you tell us about that 1912 amateur championship at, at Royal North Devon? Well, a couple things. One is um, Ball did not want to play. He was uh, 50 years old then, and he had really sort of gotten tired of the competition and gotten tired of, he hated being famous above all things. 
and he had just gotten tired of the adulation, the people meeting him at the train station and everything else like this. So uh, Abe Mitchell comes up and is joking with him and says, you know, I hear next year they're going to establish an age limit, to which Ball replies, I wish they'd done it this year. I only came because it meant so much to my friends. You know, the people that obviously Hoylake adored John Ball, uh, a, a love affair with the golfer that might might be unequaled at, at any time in history uh, is the way that people of Hoylake admired John. You know, John is the greatest, one of the greatest match play golfers in the history of the game, eight amateur championships. You can be sure that that's a record that will be stand for all time. There is no, I mean, I think Sir Michael Benalek, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, um, is the closest anyone's gotten, and that's five. He still had four to go to pass him. Uh, so it's just an, a staggering accomplishment. But to me, John Ball's biggest importance is, um, you know, I, as I said, I think Tommy lit the flame of golf in England by coming down and making that grand tour before he won the belt. But when John Ball in 1890 won the Open Championship as an amateur, see, it's really, really, really important that he won it as an amateur because all the golfers that were just taking up the game in England were rich amateurs uh, uh, like, like his father and him. And, uh, so it was really heartening to them to see that they could beat the pros and he had set the way. And then honestly, in that decade, amateurs became intensely competitive, were intensely competitive with pros. They won three of the 10 opens in the decade, two by Hilton, one by ball. And they were close a lot as Horace himself was in 1890, finishing sixth and 10th another time. So they were right there and it was ball who got that all started. So I think, you know, Ball was the first real hero of English golf. And it, importantly, he beat Scots. One, there's nothing that gets an Englishman more excited than beating the Scots, I don't think. Uh, just uh, So I think that really stirred. I know this, Willie Park Jr. had to stop playing golf for two years after John Ball won the Open because he got so many golf club orders from England that it was everything he could do to keep them full. He was just sending clubs south every day. Uh, and that's just the proof of that just shows you uh, what Ball's victory did to stir interest among English golfers. And, you know, Ball had a lifelong relationship with Westward Ho. One thing I didn't get to mention earlier is that there were always interclub matches. And one of the first and best interclub matches is was between Westward Ho and Hoylake. They had an annual home and home match where the golfers from Hoylake would come and play Westward Ho and vice versa. And that's why on your honor board, you see so many Hoylake names there. Hilton's on your honor board numerous times. Just, just to sum up, Stephen, you know, your opinions and your views on Raw North Devon's place in the history of the game, um, not only for the, you know, the, the, the incredible characters and the personalities and the, and the, the pioneers, if you like, that it's produced, but you know, it, it, it's sort of place in terms of firsts, you know, not only being the first English links, but, um, you know, where you see it in the history of the game. I think Royal North Devon is one of the most important clubs in the history of golf and certainly one of the most important clubs in the history of English golf, you know, uh, with for multiple reasons. One is I have not had the pleasure of playing it, but from everything I know, it's a brilliant golf course that presents a wonderful natural test and has, you know, been a great test for champions all through time, not just men. Royal North Devon also hosted early women's championships. They hosted the championship in 1900 uh, and in 1910 also. So twice before the war, they hosted the women's, which they never thought of calling it an amateur championship because at that time there was no concept that there would be any such thing as women's professional golf. But so they hosted the Women's Open Championship there in 1900. Rona Adair, the great Irish golfer, won, went on that year to play two matches against Old Tom that were much reported in Ballyhood. So it's been at the forefront of golf in every way, in women's golf, in, in men's championship golf, in being the first seaside links in England and, and, uh, and having one of the great natural courses of the world, and also in the two figures that it produced, Horace Hutchinson, probably the leading writer and thinker of his age, and John Henry Taylor, the indispensable man of the game who helps make public golf and professional golf a reality uh, all through England. And uh, so I feel that very few clubs uh, have as much to, to, to be proud of as North Devon. And um, if your members haven't read it, I think one of my very favorite pieces of golf literature is uh, – 
a little profile that Pat Ward Thomas wrote about Han, John Henry Taylor on his 90th birthday, you know, when he finally retired at 75 from Mid Surrey Golf Club. He moved back home to North Devon and stayed there the rest of his days overlooking the links. And uh, that essay by Ward Thomas uh, about John Henry Taylor is just one of the great pieces of golf literature. And, and I think, you know, a fitting way for him to be remembered. And of course, Bernard Darwin's writings on John Henry Taylor are always worth, I must have read his essay on John Henry 15 or 20 times. Uh, so definitely one of the great clubs in the world. Uh, it's my dream to come play it with you one of these days, Dan. And uh, I, um, I envy you being able to play that golf course. And uh, I just have endless admiration for for Westward Ho and all the things they've meant to the game. Well, of we'd golf. love to, I know I speak on behalf of all the members at, at Royal North Devon. Certainly I speak on behalf of all the members. We'd love to, uh, love to welcome you and um, see you playing the, playing the great links, the cradle of English golf. And thank you very much for your time, Stephen. I was delighted to be here, Dan and happy 160th to Royal North. Thanks Devon. very much. Cheers.